catch my breath. I ran all the way from my house. I ran all the way home. Oh, oh, come on, you guys listen to me. This boy's calling. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay, forget I'll it. Say I'm going to tell you nothing. Hold, hold on, you guys, hold on. What is it, man? Okay, great. You won't believe this. Sincerely, I ran all the way home. Screw you guys. Forget it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rob Wright. Person. <laughs> a person like that. See, I'm talking like your father now. Yeah. That's the way your father talks. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime. And you're Tova Light. <laughs> That's what I know. I know. And then this movie, um, Virginia Manson was in my first movie that I ever made. Is it's that so true? Amazing Which one was that? that? Oh, let's not even discuss well, it. It's called it. Fire with Fire. It was fire originally called Captive Heart. This but is like, you know, you it. can't put... I mean, no. what if I wanted water? Where do you go? <laughs> you gotta go like this. <laughs> A little effort. Yeah. Well, that was a beautiful, beautiful movie. How did it, uh, how did it come together? Well, this was uh, was written by a, by a guy named Guy Thomas, who is one of the strangest, you know, projects come from different places, plays, books, uh, original screenplays, and so on. This guy was a writer about 30 years ago. He wrote a movie called uh, Holy Moses with Dudley Moore. You know, not that many people saw it. And he wrote some television, and then he just hated it. He hated being, he dropped out. And he hadn't written anything for 30 years. And he was living in a trailer park, taking care of his mother. And then he lived up in Lake Malibu. And there was a woman with three daughters that lived next door. And he kind of fell in love with, uh, she was going through a divorce, just like in the movie, and he kind of fell in love with her. And he loved his, you know, the daughters, but he never felt that he could ever, and was never consummated. And it's interesting that he views himself as somebody who's in a wheelchair, that he's emotionally crippled. I mean, he was emotionally crippled, and now this guy's actually crippled. So it came to us a number of years ago, and then we reworked it, reworked it a few times. I've worked with a guy named Andy Shine, who's a writing partner, and we rewrote a lot of it, and uh, we got what it, what it's, what it turned out to, to be this. And I, what I like about it is, you know, I mean, I work with Morgan Free Freeman in the bucket list, and I like the theme. I mean, as I've gotten older, I see a lot of young faces, and this is something you'll find as you get older. I mean, people ask me what my favorite movie of all time is, and I tell them, it's a wonderful life. I love this movie, and I've loved it for years, and I, I've seen it 40 or 50 times, and what's interesting about that movie is... The movie is the same, but I'm changing it. As I get older, I appreciate that movie more and more because it's all about a celebration of life. It's all about saying, uh, you know, everybody's life is valuable and you can uh, get a lot and you should never throw it away. And that's what led me to doing Bucket List. When I turned 60, I started thinking, you know, life is pretty precious. And you don't, and you know, it's hard to think about it when you're young because you think it'll last forever. But as you get older, it becomes more and more precious because you think of it as more and more finite and so I wanted to start making movies that had that theme about embracing life getting the most out of life and here I had two guys in bucket list who had cancer they were going to die of cancer and rather than lie down and die they said we're going to live until we die we're going to live until I experience and the same thing about this film I like the idea of a guy who's given up on life you know, he, he had one big blow in his life when he lost the use of his his legs. He could no longer pitch baseball. He then all of a sudden, like his wife said, a door opens and he finds he can write. And he writes this character, Jubal McClose. Then his wife dies. And that's the second big blow because he's, he, now he thinks, nobody's ever going to love me again. And I can't write anymore. And he's given up and he starts drinking. And what I love, the, the theme of this, I love the idea that you can... 
still find goodness in life. There's there's always something, you know. And he, for you know, the magic of Belle Isle, he moves into this place. He doesn't want to be there, and just because he meets this nice lady, he's all of a sudden and his wonderful daughters, and particularly Finnegan. He's now uh, brought back to life. He can write again. He's having feelings, love feelings again for the first time in six years. And so I like that theme that, you know, we get this one shot, you know. I mean, you know, I don't believe, you know, I mean, maybe there is heaven. We don't know, but let's, we'll find out soon enough. But what if there isn't? <laughs> then this is the only deal you've got. So you've got to make the most of it. So I'm looking for, you know, I look for movies that I can express myself in that way. So that's what I like about this. You uh, you direct children so well, starting with the Stand by Me, and um, and that was even before you had children. Because sometimes you can say, okay, you know, I have children, so I know how you know direct them and so on and so forth. But Stand by Me was like before you even had it. What is this affinity that you have? Well, uh, children are very, uh, you know. Uh, if they have a talent, they may not have a craft yet, but they have a talent and ability, and they're kind of like, you know, it's like a blank canvas, you know, they're, they're just, they don't have any preconceived ideas about what to do, you know, they just go out and, and instinctively do whatever they, they do, and you can teach them craft, you can't teach talent, you know, uh, so when I did Stand By Me, I worked with, you know, in the case of Jerry O'Connell, which is funny, now he was a little chubby kid, and, and, the thing, and now he's married to Rebecca Romaine, <laughs> handsome guy, and everything, but in that, he had never acted before, and uh, there was very little experience with Will Wheaton and and uh, and River Phoenix and Corey Feldman had a little bit more experience. I basically conducted acting classes. It's like playing, you know. I, I was raised in improvisational theater. There's a wonderful book called The Improvisation for the Theater. It's written by Viola Spolin, who is the mother of a, a man named Paul Sills. Paul Sills was the creator of Second City and all of these wonderful actors that have come out of Second City. And it's basically theater games. You're playing uh, all kinds of uh, improvisational theater games. And I worked with these kids for a couple of weeks before we even started approaching the, the script. So by the time we approached the script, the kids were really uh, becoming a unit and they understood how to play with each other. There's a scene in Stand By Me, and if you look at it, I'm very, very proud of it. It, it doesn't look like anything, but if you know how difficult it is for kids at that age, and especially we had four boys, to interact with each other, to have perfect timing, to know when to come in, to know the rhythms of it. There's a scene where the, 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 the uh, Teddy Duchamp played by Corey Feldman is uh, uh, screaming at the junk man. The junk man calls his father a crazy man and that he, uh, you know, he's crazier than a shithouse rat and your father's crazy and he burnt your ear off. And Teddy's trying to defend him saying my father stormed the beach at Normandy and he's a hero in Europe, you know, and I'm gonna kill you. And they, he's crying, the, four boy, the three boys take him away and they're walking down the path, they're just coming towards us and it's just one shot until the very end. And it's one shot and they're just all talking and it doesn't look like, I said, it doesn't look like anything, but if you watch it, you see four kids, little kids who don't have any craft are now working as a unit and their timing is perfect and they know exactly when to come in and uh, it it's, uh, really makes me feel great when I watch that scene. Like I say, it doesn't look like anything but it's, it's a hard thing to achieve and, and I, I, I really like watching that. So you, you work with kids and I, you know, I love working with kids because like I say, they don't, they don't have baggage, you know, they just basically come and they're, let's play house. You know, you just have to teach them a little craft. Why do you care what a fat old pile of shit like him says about your dad? He still stormed the beach at Normandy, right? Yeah, forget it. You think that pile of shit was at Normandy? Forget it, all right? You don't know nothing about your old man. He's just dog shit. Whatever is between you and your old man, he can't change that. Forget it, all right? Just forget it. Card of a man, a knight without armor and a savage. 
I remember when uh, you were editing Stand By Me, I asked, how's the movie? And you said, I don't know if anybody will see it, but I like it. Yeah. And then you had a little screening for friends, and I was there. And at a certain point, I heard Jamie Lee Curtis behind me, like sniffling and crying. And I knew it was going to be a hit. So maybe you didn't know it at the time, you know, that who's going to come and see it, like you said. But obviously, you have a connection with an audience because you had all those. You know, hits. Some, what some, do you attribute? Yeah, sometimes you have a connection. Sometimes you don't. I mean. I, I don't really think about that. I mean, this is a tiny little film. It probably has a small audience, but it only costs $5 million to make, so it'll probably do okay. But it's not that kind of, it doesn't have that uh, broad universal thing. I mean, you know, the guy in a wheelchair made a thing. Uh, you know, it, it may not have that kind of appeal. Stand By Me uh, had an appeal because everybody was 12 years old and everybody knows what it's like to grow up and go through that and the power of friendship. And it was interesting to me because, again, I didn't know if it was going to be successful, but I, I, I knew it was reflective of my personality, so I liked it. Uh, because it was the first time I had done anything that was very divorced from anything my father might have done. The first thing I did was Spinal Tap, and it was a satire. And my father used, was, you know, was a satirist on uh, the early days of television. So I came by that naturally. And then the second thing was The Sure Thing, which was a romantic comedy. And my father had done a few, a couple of those. So this was the first time I did something that was kind of dramatic and serious, but at the same time had humor and it was kind of a mixture and was very unlike anything my father would ever have done. So it was like a coming, and oddly enough, a coming of age for me creatively, just like it was a coming of age for the, for the kids in the movie. And uh, you never know, but what, when I knew it was kind of going to be successful is when there was a the guy and by the way we didn't know because when it was a finished film we had distributed it to we would showed it to every single studio head we got turned down by everybody everybody nobody wanted this thing they didn't think it was going to be successful and we went back to columbia pictures initially when we started making the movie we were going to be done, it was going to be made by Columbia uh, for and then uh, Norman Lear had uh, it was actually Norman Lear's company he had a company called uh, Embassy and they sold the whole company to Coca-Cola Columbia Pictures and they said we don't want this movie they said no we're not interested in this Coca-Cola was, was owning at, uh, Columbia at that time they owned Columbia yeah, and Columbia turned it down we were 2 days before we were supposed to start shooting we were up there in Oregon, we had the full cast, the crew and everything, and they said, no, we're not financing this movie. I said, oh my God, you know, we're ready to go here. Norman Lear stepped in and said, I'll finance it personally. And then when we finished the film, nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> Every single studio turned it down, and we finally went back to Columbia, figuring, well, it's the last resort because they turned it down already. We went back to Columbia, and there was a new head of studio there, a fellow named Guy McElwain, who's no longer with us, but a, a very interesting guy. And uh, I knew him, and I and I showed him the film. He watched it. And he said, I don't know if anybody's going to like this, but it made me cry because it reminded me of my boyhood and when growing up. And I said, and I knew Guy had grown up, you know, in, in the city. In, you know, he was a, a city kid. And I said, well, he says, yeah, but it doesn't matter. And that's when I knew we had a, a shot because these were four kids from a rural area, but it didn't matter because... The feelings that you have with friendship is the same, whether it's, uh, you know, rural, urban, whatever. And so I th knew we had a shot at that point. And he said, yes, we'll do it. And we got lucky. And then it opened the big right away. Did it build up? Well, what? well, here's what's interesting. The, the f film business is wildly different now than, than in those days. In those, the, Stand By Me never did more than $3.5 million in a weekend which if it, it had a picture now that did three and a half million dollars in the first weekend, <laughs> it's a disaster beyond belief, and it'd be yanked out of the theaters. We stayed in theaters, People, films would stay in theaters, and it did three and a half million dollars every single week until we got to about almost 60 million dollars. Wow. For a little tiny film for seven and a half million dollars was a big, a big deal. Now you have to open with huge numbers, otherwise they take you out of the theater. So. It was a different time. A picture called Flashdance in those days. A picture made $100 million, never did more than $4 million in a weekend. 
but pictures would stay stay in the theaters in those days. Yeah. They don't stay now. You tend to work with the same people. Yeah. Um, what does it give you as a director, other than the obvious thing of like shorthand? Is there anything more than... Well, this oddly enough, this was the first time I'd ever done a film without the editor that I've worked on I think I've done now 16 or 17, I th can't remember, but all the films I ever did, from Spinal Tap on, I worked with the same editor, Bob Layton, who's a great guy, but we had so little money here, we couldn't afford, I couldn't afford him, I couldn't afford the script supervisor, I couldn't afford a lot of the people I worked with, so we had to find new people in New York City, and we worked, you know, we worked with new people, and I, and I'd never done a film uh, digitally, you know, every film I'd done up till that point was was on on film. After doing this, I love digital. I would never make a film again on film. Seriously, I'm not one of those snobs like that. I mean, I like when there's a new technology and something you can use. I mean, when the Avid first came on, you know, I was like, I I started on a Moviola which is a really ancient editing machine. You know, where you look at it like this and it goes through a thing. And then I went to the chem and then, then the Avid came out and I thought for a second, oh, I don't know, maybe it doesn't give you the time that you need to really just, just you know, uh, process the thing and make, and then once I got on the Avid, I said, this is great. <laughs> you know, you can make decisions, you can try different things. If it doesn't work, you don't have to wait 15, 20 minutes to put the new piece of film together. So I like all this stuff. And I like the, you know, they're getting better and better, the cameras. We worked with this, uh, you know, this Alexa. You know, it's an amazing camera. It really does, you know, it produces a great image. And I just like it, you know. Plus, you can see what you have right then and there. You know, you know exactly what you're going to have. You have a little tent. You sit there and you look at the tent and it tells you what it's going to be. So I like, I like, you know, this experience. <laughs> Excuse me, I have allergies <laughs> in March. But uh, yeah, normally I do work with the same the same people, and uh, that does make it easier. And you like if it's like a family. And and I've always said, you know, the filmmaking process is it's all process. Everything's process. Forget the end result. I mean, it'll be good. It'll be bad. You don't know. But if you've got a decent script and you've cast it well, then you want the process of making the film to be pleasurable because that's what you remember. It's all process. So you want to be around people that you enjoy, that are creative, that are not going to cause... You say, hey, you wake up in the morning, you come to work, hey, I got to see that person again. I like that person. I like to see this person. That's, that's what's what you remember. And when films come on, you know, that I've made, and, you know, they come on television or whatever, and I watch it, to me, it's, I don't watch the film. I watch, the, it's like home movies for me. I remember, oh, that was the day we had the, the that was the, you know, you, you look into things, like the kid that played the, the Carl, Carl Luke. You know, I thought, oh my God, we have to dump him in water. He's got a thing. Turns out he was a lifeguard. You know, that nerdy guy had been a lifeguard. He says, oh, the water, I'm fine with that. But he was also claustrophobic. So when he got stuck inside the jumper, that was like a scary thing for him. So you'll, those are the things. That was the day that car, that, you know, poor Ash, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. We're so stuck. I remember one time I saw you and your uh, producing partner having lunch, and I said, "Ah, did you finish your movie?" And you said, "No, we're still filming." I said, "How can you be filming? You're having lunch in Beverly Hills." And you said, "We already shot it this morning. By one o'clock, you were having lunch." Oh, well, but is that the bucket list? <laughs> oh yeah, I shoot very short days. I'm the exact opposite of, of Stanley Kubrick. I like the, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. That what I heard. I mean, he's a brilliant filmmaker, so I. Should shouldn't uh, get, I mean, you know, I, I should be so good. But, I mean, he liked to shoot, you know, 100 takes or whatever, you know, and I asked Jack Nicholson because he worked with him on uh, Shining, and I asked him, I said, what is it, you know, what was that like, you know, working with Stanley Kubrick? And Jack said, yeah, I told Stanley before the film, he says, I, I, hear, I hear you like to do a lot of takes. <laughs> so my feeling is if we do 100 takes, the 101st one is the best. 
And he was like saying, I don't care, I'll just go forever. But uh, actors like me because if we get it, they we move on, we have a rhythm to it. And, and Morgan particularly likes working with because Morgan is ready to shoot immediately. He's ready the, the minute he's ready to go. And so Bucket List was like that. Jack's the same way. He goes like this. And so you finish your day's work. What do you have to keep going for? <laughs> <laughs> but but, but um, when you shot A Few Good Men, you had both Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson. They right. probably work in different ways, don't well, they? Well, they, they do, but they don't. I mean, they're both great professional actors. I mean, the thing that was interesting about Jack in that is that he's one of the great actors of all time. I mean, you know, if you wanted to list the top ten actors that have ever been on the screen, you know, maybe Brando and then Jack Nicholson is one, you know, one and one A or something. I mean, they're one of the best. And Jack, when we first did Few Good Men, um, we had a lot of people, you know, Demi Moore and Tom Cruise and Kevin Bacon and, you know, J2, a lot of good actors sitting around the first day of the reading. And a lot of times when an actor does a reading, with the first reading, they kind of just mark it, they kind of go through it, they don't give you a real performance. Well, Jack comes in there, sits down, and gives a full performance wow. the first day of the reading. And it was interesting, because you're watching all the young actors, they were like, oh, I see, this is like professional here. <laughs> I better up my game here, because this guy is the great, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, the baseball analogy is like, you know, Babe Ruth steps in, you know, everybody's getting their hits in the cage, and all of a sudden Babe Ruth steps in, it's like, oh my God, look at that ball, look at how it's, it's traveling into the upper deck, and you know, we gotta, we gotta get our game together here because the Babe is here, you know, so, <laughs> so that's the way it was, and Jack set that tone, and uh, it made it a lot easier for me, and now, now, when we went to shoot that courtroom scene, you know, the scene where he says, you know, you can't handle the truth, and there's a big, you know, he's got that big speech that he gives to, to Tom Cruise, and I said, you know, Jack, we're going to have a lot of coverage in this because we got Kevin Bacon, I got Demi Moore, I got the, the, uh, I got the, uh, the guys who were on trial, the two Marines, I got, you know, uh, you know, Kevin, uh, you know, I got everybody here. I got to kick, you know, a lot of cutaways. Kevin so Kevin Pollack, yeah, Kevin Pollack. So I said, you know, we can do either your side first, or I can shoot them, and you can be off camera, and then I'll shoot their reactions and whatever you want to do, whatever you feel comfortable doing. And he says, you know, you could shoot them, and that way it'll give me a chance to rehearse, and I'll rehearse it as we go along. By the time you're too ready to turn around on me, I'll be ready and I'll be up to speed. I said, fine. So we started shooting uh, people's reactions, and he's off camera now, and what you see on the screen, the final performance, is exactly how we did it off camera. Every single time. We do it once, we do it twice, and after three or four times, I said, Jack, you know, maybe you should save it. I mean, you're doing a full performance every time. It's not on camera. Why don't you save some of this energy and this power for when he says, Rob, you don't understand. <laughs> he says, I like to act. <laughs> I don't get a chance to act in parts this good. So, you know, we, for him, for me, it was a pleasure. We're easy to work with, you know. He loves to work. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. I want to open up uh, the floor to the students so they can ask you questions. Uh, guys, where is that? Here? Here. Okay. So please go and stand behind. Hello. Hello. I am Michaela Hughes. I'm one of the instructors here at the school. Okay. Um, big fan. Love all of your Thank films. Thank you. Um, I read an article some time ago um, uh, when A Few Good Men came out, um, and I believe Tom Cruise was talking about how, with working with you, how he initially didn't understand the sort of sarcasm and comedic rhythms that his character, that Kathy, needed. Um, can you talk a little bit about working with actors in maybe something not as a familiar role that they're used to doing. Right, and th that's a good, good point because it's true. Tom had really never done any comedy up till that point. 
I mean, not that few, few Good Men is a comedy, it's not, but there are humorous moments, and you need to get those moments just right. You know, when, and when uh, you know, he says, I know what you're going to say, you know, uh, we're, you know, you, you like me, uh, you know, good luck tomorrow, you like me, but you know, I'm not going to make you say it. And then to me, Moore says, I was just going to tell you to wear matching socks. <laughs> and he goes, okay. Good tip, you know, and he does it like that, and you have to do it that way in order to get the giggle. I was just going to tell you to wear matching socks tomorrow. Okay. Good tip. What I said, and some actors are fine with this, and others aren't. The easiest way to 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 communicate those things to an actor, if you're an actor, which I am, is just do it for them. Show them what you want, and if they're not. If they don't have a big ego about this, that they're fine. So Tom would say that all the time. Tell me how you want it. He had a great ear, so he could have, it's like a musician, telling a musician, play the notes this way. Da, 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 you know, play it that way and you'll get it. And so if you got a guy with a good ear, he'll go da, 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 and he'll play it. And so I showed him how to do it, and he, right before we, we you know, were shooting, he said, let me hear it again, let me hear it again, and I did it for him, and then he did it right back. So that's how you can do it. Now, some people have innate senses of humor, and they can get it right away. But I think Tom has learned over, you know, because he was in Jerry Maguire, he's learned now how to do some of that stuff. But up until that point, he hadn't done it. In yeah, fact, they did Paul Anderson, it was brilliant. I think you're directing kind of that him in that role changed his whole acting career actually well i don't know about that but i mean uh, well thanks i think i appreciate it but he certainly picked it up he knew how to do it in paul Hi. anderson um, the bit that he did yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. great comedy Hi. um you've directed comedies and uh, dramas and i was wondering if there's any fundamental way that you approach them differently no you approach them exactly the same if they if 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 it's going to be funny, it has to come out of someplace real, and so you want the actors to play the, the reality of the moment. If they play the reality of the moment and it's written in a certain way and there's a certain rhythm to it, if they get that rhythm right, it'll be funny. But you don't want them to play funny, because if they play funny, then it's it, not so funny. You want them to play it very real and honestly, and if the writers have done their job and constructed it with the right kind of rhythm, then they'll get the last. I said, be sorry about Sherby. You just look the ball into your glove. Shooting two. Sorry. You got to trust me, Sherby. You keep your eyes open, your chances of catching the ball increase by a factor of 10. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Renner. My name is Lisa. Um, I think my English is not good enough to. It's pretty uh, darn good. <laughs> uh, where are you from? I'm from Beijing, China. Well, I can guarantee it's a lot better than my Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not good enough to express how much I, was, how much I love this film. Oh, because thank I, you. As a girl who used to carry a knife when she was young, <laughs> as a writer who enjoys having whiskey sometimes, I really love this film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were you, a, were, you a, were you a tomboy? You know what a tomboy is? Yeah, I know what tomboy is. Tomboy. Yeah. Were you a tomboy as a, as a little girl? Um, not really. I just no. happened to have some friend in the okay. neighborhood who is a teenager gangster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, uh, what's the most important thing um, you always remember when you're giving direction to your actors? Uh, well, it's different for every actor. Every actor you talk to differently depending on, on whether they need a lot of attention or a little attention or a lot of, uh, you know, pushing or standing back. You, you have to sense, it's like, you know, uh, when you're raised, you have children, you know, you raise your ch certain children need to be uh, structure or lots of structure and you need to be in there and a lot of ch other children you kind of back away from. And so you have to kind of sense. And I don't... I don't, I try to, f I fly by the seat of my pants when it comes to that stuff. You try to feel what they need at a, at a particular point in time. Um, I remember once when I was doing um, a Stand By Me and, and River Phoenix was having a real hard time. There's a scene where 
and he's talking to Gordy, and they're talking about the, the teacher that stole the milk money, and they blamed it on him, and he's all upset, and he starts to cry about how a guy, a kid like that will never get a break because they'll always blame him because he's a, you know, a kid from below the tracks. And he needed to cry in that scene, and uh, he couldn't, he had a hard time with it and couldn't do it. And so I took him aside just very quietly, and, and I thought this might work for him because I had a sense of what his family dynamics. He had a really strong, good mother, and but a father who was kind of absent a lot of the time. And I said, think of a time when an adult let you down and really let you down. And I, you don't have to tell me what it is. I just want you to think about that, and then we'll do the scene. And then the performance you see is that one. It's the only time he did it that way. And that's using a Stanislavski kind of sense memory type thing. But some actors, they want, you know, there's a very famous story about uh, Laurence Olivier and Anthony Quinn doing Beckett on Broadway and Anthony Quinn is struggling and he's trying I try to get the moment and I need the I need my motivation for what should I do at this moment and Lawrence Olivier says to him louder and faster my boy louder and faster <laughs> so basically I'm saying that if you just do that it'll be it'll work so sometimes you rely on technique other times you rely on other kinds of tricks and it depends on the actor okay thank you so much thank you, thank you. My name's Chris, I'm a filmmaker, uh, filmmaker. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what made you decide to become a uh, director? You know, when I was very young, and I was 19 years old, um, I directed, I had my own improvisational theater group that I acted in, that I also directed when I was at UCLA. And so, I always was somebody who could see the overall, you know? It was the way I looked at everything. When I was, like, when I did All in the Family and I was doing a scene, I was aware of where all the cameras were, I was aware of the other actors, and I was aware of the audience at the same time, just like I'm doing now. I'm aware of people. It's just a weird kind of thing where, now, I also have, I always said this about directors. Directors, they're basically not the best at anything. I mean, there are actors on the on the on the on the on the set. They're better than them. The writers are better. The musicians are better. The lighting guys better. They're all better. <laughs> but if you have a kind of general working knowledge of everything, it's like a jack of all trades, and you kind of understand. That's why I say to a lot of directors who come up through technical uh, filmmaking, go to an acting class. You know, even if you're not going to be an actor, go to an acting class. Learn what it is that an actor goes through when he has to do a scene so that you have a working knowledge and you can be fluent, you know, when you're talking to the composer, when you're talking to the, to the, the, to the uh, DP, when you're talking to the production designer, when you talk to the actors. You have a little sense of all of how it works. And I, had, I always knew I had an overview of things. And it's not necessarily the best way to act, I can tell you. You should, when you're an actor, you should just be focused on what it is you're doing. You shouldn't be thinking about where lights are, where cameras are, and all that. You have to be focused, let other people worry about it. But I was always looking around and thinking about other, other things. So I kind of knew that that's what I was going to do. <laughs> Hi. Hi. My name is Theo. I'm from Sweden. Hi, Theo. Hi, from Sweden. Rob. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about uh, Spinal Tap. I love, I love that film. Thank uh, you. It's it's very very funny. Um, that style of like mockumentary is really popular now, or it's like have been for ten years maybe something like that. Um, 
Did you come up with that, or like, yes. how did you, how did you come up with that? <laughs> yes, we were, the, we were the first persons to do something like that, because we always thought uh, it was going to be, a, we wanted to be, I saw, we saw uh, the last waltz, it was a movie Martin Scorsese made about the Bob Dylan's band, it was called The Band, and it was their last tour, and we looked at all these rock and roll documentaries, and we thought, well, we're going to make a documentary about this, this band, this fictional band. And so we didn't term the, make the term mockumentary. Somebody else made that term up. You know, we, we called it a rockumentary. And then <laughs> somebody else said mockumentary. But we always knew that we were going to try something like that. That was the idea. And, and we knew that uh, when we made the first deal to, to write the script, that it was going to be uh, hopeless. Because in order to give it a documentary feel, you can't really write that. You have to get the right improvisational actors and actually do it. So I convinced the guy who was the head of the studio to give me money that he was going to give me for the script, and we would make some of the film. So we made like 20 minutes of the film. We had some concert footage, some backstage footage, some interview footage, and we put it together in like a 20-minute demo reel, and then he didn't want to make it. Nobody wanted to make it. <laughs> and then we went around and uh, we send, you know, we finally got somebody to agree to do it. But yeah, we always knew we were going to do it. But it, it doesn't work unless you get actors who can do it. I mean, Chris Guest, who's made all his pictures for our company, for Castle Rock, you know, uh, Waiting for Guffman and, and uh, Mighty Wind and, and uh, Best in Show and, and For Your Consideration are all done the same way. You get a, a improvisational actors and you have a basic outline and then you just have them improvise. And then you make the film with the, you make the, you write the script with the pieces of film. It's almost like in a backwards kind of way. By the way, I just want to say that I saw for your consideration the Toronto Film Festival and it was the funniest thing I ever saw. And yeah. then I went out of town and I came back, the movie came and played and nothing happened. I just don't understand. Yeah, no, it, but I think it was too inside. I think, you know, it was too, a little too hip for the room and kind of inside. Yeah. I mean, the best in show to me was the best one. I mean, they had the broadest audience because a lot of people like dogs and they watch that Westminster <laughs> dog show and so they knew what the fun, what the references were. Yes. I mean, when Spinal Tap came out, nobody knew what the hell we were doing. I mean, it was a disaster, you know? I mean, it, it's nice to see, you know, young people picking it up, but I mean, you were uh, not even born when Spinal Tap first came out. How old are you? 23. Yeah, yeah, you weren't even born. I mean, Spinal Tap we made in 1982, so that's, that's, that's what, 30 years ago? 30 years ago. Wow. Isn't it? No. Don't ask me. I mean, I yeah, 30, 30 years ago, yeah. We made it 30 years ago, and at, when we first... I was around. Huh? I was around. I know. I, know. <laughs> I was around. But the point is, we made it, and then we put it in the, th you know, in the theater in Dallas. We tried to test it, you know, and the audience was like, it was a disaster. I mean, people came up and said, well, why would you make a movie about a band that nobody ever heard of <laughs> and a band that's so bad why don't you make a movie about like the beatles or the rolling stones or something this these, these guys are terrible and i said oh my god you know this is like satire people didn't understand it you know and i remembered a, a very uh, this is a great story my, my best friend as a kid growing up was albert brooks Albert Brooks, I don't know if you know Albert Brooks, but did you, see, you see Drive, Drive, he was in uh, Drive, he played the, the, the uh, you know, the, the mafia kind of guy in this, uh, the uh, Ryan Gosling movie, Drive. Anyway, he was a comedian, he was a stand-up, and he was going on The Tonight Show, which was uh, Johnny Carson, this is before Jay Leno, and he was going on The Tonight Show, and he had this routine that he was going to do, and the idea was... Uh, he was going to play a mime. He was a mime, a mime artist. He was in white face. He had the black leotards. And the thing was, he did nothing but talk. <laughs> and all he did was talk. He talked. He says, he says, look, I'm pulling the rope. There's, there's no rope here. You can see there's no rope. He says, look, I'm walking against the wind. He says, look, I'm inside the box. I mean, he just basically talked the whole time. And nobody laughed because they said, this is, he's the worst mime ever. He's talking the whole time. How can he be, how could this be a good mime? He literally didn't get one laugh. And so so I thought, wow, what a brilliant piece, nobody laughed. So now, a few weeks later, I, might, I, I remember because my dad was co-host, was sub-hosting sub that night. My dad thought it was funny, but nobody else. 
But um, <laughs> then a few weeks later, they called him up, because he had been on The Tonight Show a number of times. They called him up a few weeks later, and they said, we'd like you to come back. And I said, I was rooming with Albert at the time. We, had, we shared a house together. And I said, Albert, what are you going to do? What are you going to do on the thing? He says, I'm going to do that mind piece again. I said, what are you, crazy? I said, you didn't get one laugh. He said, yeah, but it's funny. I said, I know it's funny, but it, nobody laughed. He says, yeah, but it's funny. I said, all right, listen, do it every one. So now he goes back out there. Now, Johnny Carson, who was the, like I say, the guy before Jay Leno, Johnny Carson was hosting the show. And uh, he had never seen this bit. And Albert comes out, again with white face, black leotards, starts the routine. Again, nobody's laughing. Nobody. But Carson is starting to laugh hysterically. He is like, his gut, and I was there that night. He was, he, 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 he was like he was going to throw up. He was laughing so hard. His guts were falling. He laughed so hard at this thing, he, started, he fell off his chair. Now, the audience saw that. They realized, oh, I get it. This is not a real mime. This guy's making fun of And then they picked it up, and they started to laugh. So those kinds of things, like satire, it takes a while for people to get what that is. But, you know, luckily, Spinal Tap's been around such a long time, and now people, you know, they like it and they, they appreciate it. It's become like this kind of cult thing, you know. But when it first came out, it was like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. And I like a person who's 23 years old is, is, is discovering this, you know. Because we as filmmakers, you make things, you want them to last. You know, you, you build them to last because you want generations to, to see these things. You know, otherwise, you know, you just make it and it goes into the ether and nobody sees them. So I like that I make, you know, I made a film like Princess Bride, who young people pick up on it, you know, and parents who were little when it first came out. That was came out 25 years ago. And your parents are now growing up. They were, you know, six, seven years old. Now they've got kids and they can show it. And so that gives me a tremendous kick. But I'm glad you I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. That was that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. How are you? Good, thank you. What is the last and or most <coughs> shocking experience you've had? The la the most shocking experience I had? Well, I don't know if it's the most shocking, but uh, this was one of the strangest experiences I ever had. When I was doing a movie, when I was doing Princess Bride, the ending of the movie, you remember, I don't know if you've seen it, you see at the end Peter Falk, who's the grandfather, he goes, as you wish. And he leaves the room and, uh, you know, the, 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 the movie's over. Well, what we had before that ending is he would leave and the little boy would pick the book up and start leafing through the book because he was so excited he wanted to read it again. And we had a scene where all of a sudden he hears some rustling outside his window. He looks outside his window and there's Fezzik and Inigo and Wesley and Buttercup on the four white horses and they're suspended in the sky and they're kind of waving at him. And he was waving it back, you know? And so in order to shoot this, we had to create a, a stage with a black background and get these four horses, and we had to shoot the, you know, the four actors on the four horses. Now, Andre the Giant, just to tell you about Andre the Giant, well, I love this guy, he was the greatest guy. He used to drink a lot. He drank a lot, and I, but it never seemed to bother him that much. I mean, I, one day I came, he came to work and I said, Andre, how much did you, what did you do last night? And he says, well, I went to the bar, I had a couple of drinks. I said, how much do you drink? He says, you know, three bottles of cognac, <laughs> about 12 bottles of wine. He says, Jesus Christ. I said, you get drunk? He says, no, I don't get drunk, a little tipsy. Drunk. <laughs> All right, so this day we're about to shoot this thing where he's, you know, uh, going to be in the, in, and we had to find a, whore, a horse, there was no horse that could, that could take his weight. He weighed like 500 pounds, he was like 7 foot 5. He weighed 500 pounds, so we, create, we, we erected a, a pulley system where we could, you know, take the weight off the horse. We, we paint the, you know, the, the, the cables out. Anyway, this day that we were about to shoot this, the Nouveau Beaujolais comes out in, in London. There's a wine. 
and Andre starts drinking this wine at like nine o'clock in the morning. He's now by nighttime, it's now eight o'clock at night, and we're gonna test this whole pulley system, and it's dark and at, at Shepherd and Studios. He's had maybe 20 bottles of this stuff. And they take me down to the sound stage, and it's kind of misty rain, it's a little rainy, and they open these huge uh, uh, stage doors, and there is the four of them with Andre, a drunken giant being lowered from the ceiling, uh, you know, with this pulley system to go on the thing. And he's going, hello, boss, like this. And I'm thinking, what do I do for a living? What is this job? What kind of, what kind of job do I have? And that was one of the strangest moments I've had in the show. <laughs> Uh, my name's Ethan, I'm an actor, um, and a huge fan. Thank you. Um, quick question, I was wondering, in all your films, there's always a great dynamic between characters and a reoccurring theme of celebration of life and love and friendship, but I've also noticed the kind of idea of completion, the idea of the yin and the yang, two people, or for kind of completing each other, whether it be When Harry Met Sally, or this, or The Bucket List, or Flipped. Um, and I was just wondering what draws you to that. I think we, you know, we need each other. We need each other on this planet. You know, you can't get through with this life without other people helping you along. And I think the most, to me, the most interesting thing is how people interact with each other. And if you can capture it, you know, honestly, I think that's why you see so many reality shows. Not that that's reality, but, but I mean, you see a lot of these reality shows on television now because people are fascinated just to have a window into how people behave. But there's no artistry to any of these reality shows. Mm -hmm. To me, the artist can take what he sees around them and write it in such a way that deepens it slightly, but not so much that it doesn't resonate as something we recognize and we see ourselves in it. And that to me is the most thrilling thing you can do. And to me, if you can marry drama and comedy in a most realistic way, that to me is the most satisfying theater you can possibly have. And the interaction of people in that way, because life is funny and sad, I mean, it's all these things. And I remember when I was 17 years old, I was an apprentice at a summer theater in, in, in Pennsylvania, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I saw this play called A Thousand Clowns by Herb Gardner. And it was a very serious subject matter about whether or not this little boy was going to be taken away from his uncle by child protective services and all this stuff. And yet it was very funny, but it was a very real dramatic thing and it was funny. And I said, wow, you mean you can blend humor and, and seriousness and put them in the same piece of work? And I realized you could do it. And I said, that's the kind of stuff I want to be able to do. And I think when, you know, you got to find those stories that 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 mean something to you and then if it really means something to you it's going to mean something to somebody else because we're not none of us are unique we're all the same you know we all do the same things we all love we all hate we all get angry we all do all the things you know so if you can tap into something that you're going through that's honest you'll get people to to see it and that's what to me is is the most fun is to find ways in which human beings bump up against each other and and you know i mean it's hard these these days in the movie industry because the studios are not interested in any of that stuff they were interested in you know pyrotechnics and and, and visual effects and and larger than life comic books and stuff like that but there is a room for these kind of films small ones you can make it for a very small amount of money and there's there's places for these kinds of films and it's much more satisfying, I think, unless you're just a, you know, a tech guy, you know, and you like to, you know, tinker with toys. I mean, a lot of people like that. And I, you know, listen, I hand it to James Cameron, you know, God, you know, he loves that stuff. He loves to go under water and, down to, and develop a new camera to do that. And that's great because then he gives you Avatar and he gives you all those spectaculars that you look at and stuff like that. But... Uh, for a lot of a lot of us, we're interested in storytelling and people and characters, and so that's what I'm interested in anyway. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Rensen, I'm from the UK. 
Nice uh, first, I just want to say Bucket List is such a brilliant film. Oh, thank I've you. Been, uh, a firm believer of time is gold, you know, value life and everything. But uh, on that note, um, obviously you directed uh, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman in that movie. What is it like being as an actor directing a fellow actor with your visions and you, you know, sharing your experiences and your visions with them? Well, one of the movie? things that helps you in working with actors, if you've been an actor, is they know that you know what you're what they're going through and so it's like a coach you know being a good coach on a basketball team or I never ask an actor to do anything that I couldn't do and I'm not the best actor in the world I'm not the worst but that's why I think a lot of times the really great ball players don't make such good coaches because they don't understand why somebody can't do exactly what they did but I understand what actors go through, so it makes it easier uh, when I'm working with them. I mean, I love working with them because they appreciate that I appreciate them, and it makes it a lot easier. So, I mean, I love working with Morgan Freeman. If I could do every movie in my life with him, I would do it because he's just the easiest, and he knows I'll never ask him to do anything that I couldn't do. You know, there's a lot of directors, what, you know, they'll just say, do, if they don't know what an actor goes through, they'll say, well, just move over there, do that. And then the actor, well, gee, that doesn't feel right. I mean, I, you know, they'll do it because they're told to do it, or maybe they'll fight you on it. But I never, ever ask an actor to do something I couldn't do. Thank you. Hey, Rob. Uh, Julia, great work. Great, great work. Thank you. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Flipped. Oh, uh, thank you. So much that I used to tell my girlfriend, why can't you love me like she does? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I was curious as to how, I mean, they're young actors. How did you help them? Like, every time I saw that kid on screen, like, he had a spark of, like, wow, I am in love with this. Like, even when he hated her. Yeah, yeah. He loved that girl. Yeah. Um, how did you help him out with that? That was a tough one for us because, first of all, I, I'm, I love that you love Flipped. It's one of my favorite movies of any movie I've made. Hardly anybody ever saw it. Um, to me, it's like Stand By Me and Flipped are my two all-time favorite movies because of the ones I've made because it's about what you go through when you're 12 going on 13. In the case of Stand By, it's about friendship and learning how to like yourself as a person. In the case of Flipped, it's about the, feel, the first feelings of love that you have for the opposite sex and what you go through. Uh, it was very hard because a Callan, who's a wonderful, he's a really smart kid, he was, he's from Australia. And he speaks with a very thick Australian accent, but he could do an American accent. For some reason, Aussies seem to be able to do American accents pretty well. And for him, it was just, I mean, he was so smart that I could, you know, John Cusack was the same way and sure thing. You get a smart kid, and then you can show them what you want them to do. I mean, in my case, I could show them what I wanted them to do, and they can pick it up. But it's, it's, it's casting. It's finding the right kid. And that was a really hard thing to find that kid. So hard. We looked through so many. We found Maddie Carroll immediately. And by the way, she plays the part in this one, too. You know, she plays Willow in this. Uh, she's a gifted actress, and she was the first uh, girl that walked in. I went, she's perfect, exactly what I'm looking for you know for Julie but for Bryce we looked at so many actors you know because it's interesting at that age 13 you know most 13 year old boys and particularly Callan was a soccer player he played sports he did all those things and then he got injured and he couldn't play and he was like bored and he didn't know what to do so he says well, well I'll go to the theater class you know and he just went and fell into it you know because most kids at that age uh, boys, particularly, they're not interested in, you know, play acting. And what is that? Let's play ball. Let's play sports. Let's do, you know. But every once in a while, you luck out and you find a kid that, you know, for whatever reason, he found his way into that, which, you know, but it was hard to find, really hard to find. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks. Hello, my name is Alberto, and I would like to know more about your work uh, in Mystery. And how is it like to work with Kathy Bates? Well, Kathy Bates is one of the best actresses that ever acted. I mean, she I've seen her on stage a million times, and she's absolutely brilliant. And she won an Oscar for that film, and she deserved it. She was unbelievable. What's the matter? 
I'll tell you what's the matter. I go out of my way for you. I do everything to try and make you happy. I feed you, I clean you, I dress you, and what thanks do I get? Oh, you bought the wrong paper, Annie. I can't write on this paper, Annie. Well, I'll get your stupid paper, but you just better start showing me a little more appreciation around here, Mr. Man. It's easy to work with somebody like Kathy. Jimmy, the, the tough thing for me was working with Jimmy and Kathy together because they work in completely different ways. Jimmy doesn't like, Jimmy Kahn, I'm talking about James Kahn, he doesn't like any rehearsal. He doesn't like any rehearsal. Kathy is a stage trained actress and she likes lots of rehearsal. <laughs> so it was a matter of getting her to rehearse less and getting him to rehearse more. And it was very, very hard uh, to, to, to do that. That was a, a really tough thing. And they were confined in that little room the whole time, and that made it really difficult. They got on each other's nerves a little bit. But maybe that was a good thing for the film. Jimmy Kahn is a very active, almost ADHD kind of guy. And so for him to be stuck in that bed, you know, for the entire movie, it was like driving him crazy. Every day he'd come to the set and I'd say, okay, Jimmy, in this scene, you're in bed. I would say that to him every day just to try to make him laugh. I mean, but it was, it was, it was hard for him. It was, it was hard for him. Thank you very much. He wanted to whack some people. He like, wanted to yeah, get anything, maybe move around a little bit. Hello, my name is Stan Bain. And, um, I was just wondering, when you were young, what inspired you to act? Um, you know, I was a kid. I grew up in a, in a family of uh, show business. My father was on television. Here's an interesting story. My father was on television before we owned a television. <laughs> That's the weird one. We bought a television so that we could see him on television. <laughs> because he was on every, every started in 1949, on live television. So I, w I was raised in that. So I, that's what inspired me. He was my inspiration. And he used to say, when we were little, I remember, I guess when I was in 1951, I didn't really know when I was that little, when I was two years old in 1949. But by 51, I was four, and uh, he used to say, okay, at the end of the show, I'm gonna, we, they, we have curtain calls and we're all gonna stay, we all the cast members stand out there and I'm, when I go like this with my tie, I'm gonna adjust my tie. That's me saying hello to you and telling you I love you when I go like this. Hello. So every Saturday night I would watch and sure enough he'd go like this with his tie, just straighten his tie a little bit. Aww. And that was his way. He says, I'm not allowed to say hi to you. I can't wave to you and say hi because it's not, it's not professional, but I'll just go like this Aww. and you'll know it's me. Aww. Thank you. So good. <laughs> good evening, sir. Hi. I, my question is, out of all the films that you've ever done, and by the way, I remember, I think one of the funniest things I ever read was when uh, it was a movie review on The Princess Bride, and it mentioned how you, a couple of times during the Billy Crystal scene, how you had to how you had to kind of leave the set because he kept cracking you up every yeah, day. Yeah, he, he, he had lived a lot. <laughs> you know, when he said that, uh, it's, a, it's a, the MLT, mutton, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. <laughs> he just made that up. <laughs> so it was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, there's a lot, a lot of that stuff. Sonny, true love is the greatest thing in the world. Except for a nice MLT, a mutton, lettuce, and tomato sandwich when the mutton is nice and lean and the tomato is ripe. They're so perky. I love that. But that's not what he said. He distinctly said to blave. And as we all know, to blave means to bluff. Huh? My question is, if you could go back in time and relive the experience, not change anything, not, re not change anything at all, but relive the experience on set, which, move, which movie and set would you go back and relive on? That's a really good question because I've had really good experiences. I've had lots of great experiences. But I'd have to say stand by me. Again, because it was like a coming of age for me. It was, it, I, I was making a movie that I really loved. I felt that it, it, it reflected my sensibility in, 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 a, in a very deep way. And I thought, you know, if this picture is successful, it'll be, it'll be a good thing because it'll validate the kinds of things I like. I was worried if it wasn't successful, it meant that the things that I was attracted to, the things I really liked, audiences wouldn't like. So the whole time making that movie, it was a labor of uh, discovery and coming of age and all of that stuff. And I was up in Oregon 
uh, we were there for 60 days shooting, and it was so weird. Oh, I got a great story. I'm going to tell you a great story. <laughs> it's a little blue. Is that okay? It's a great story, though. First of all, we had 60 days, beautiful sunshine, right? Um, and in Oregon, you know, the whole picture takes place over a two-day period. So it all has to match, you know? And, and, and it did. I mean, we, we never got rain or anything. The only time I wanted it to be overcast was when they found the body. I wanted it to have this windy, kind of overcast, kind of, you know, eerie kind of feel to it. Well, it was, again, bright sunny the whole time. <laughs> so what we did is we silked in a whole long section of this forest to give us this kind of, you know, dark, overcast look. And we wanted the wind to be whipping, you know, and all of the trees were blowing. So we got all these big ritters and e-fans. We brought them all for Hollywood. Because a big wide shot, it was a big area that had to be covered. And you had to see trees move just outside the frame. Everything's still and dead because there's no wind. There's nothing. So the wind is blowing, blowing. And we had people on with little e-fans. And then we had all the production assistants on, on, on little bushes, on a bush, on, you know, little monofilaments jiggling the bushes because we had to get every, you know, we had to cover everything. There was a cr girl named Carol Bonifil, and she was on one of those, she had one of those monofilament things. And so now, we're ready to shoot, and the four boys are coming down the hill, and the cameras are starting to roll, and the Ritter fans, and if you've been on sets with Ritter fans, it's so noisy and so loud, you can't hear it. The, uh, the assistant director, Irby Smith, was on a bullhorn to be able to tell them action, you know, to get the boys to come down the, the hill to the dead body. Well, it's all going, it's everything's moving, to da, 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 and I'm looking over there, and it's Carol Bonifil, you know, and it, it's, not, it's dead. And I, and I said, Herb, and I'm going, Irby, Irby, look, look. And he, at the top of his lungs over the, over, the, over the bullhorn, he goes, Carol, yank your bush! <laughs> <laughs> so that was, <laughs> that's why it's my favorite. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, I'm very impressed with your body of work, particularly uh, all in the family. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know if you could further elaborate on your experiences, uh, what you extrapolated from them, hanging out with your father, say like uh, on the old Dick Van Dyke show set in the early 60s. And well, what you said is, I mean, the, between the Dick Van Dyke show and all the family, that was my tutelage. That's where I learned uh, everything I know about filmmaking and telling stories. When I was 13 years old, 13, 14, 14, 15, 16, I went, uh, during the summer when I was off from school, I went with my father every single day down to Desilu Kuanga, which is Desilu Studio, and I watched. I just sat and watched. I watched how the writers worked. I watched how the director blocked their scenes. I watched how he used the cameras. All that stuff. And then when I did All in the Family, same thing. Uh, I did write some of the shows, but I also, when I wasn't in a scene, I'd go up in the booth and watch how they uh, orchestrated the cameras. So to me, it was like, you know, getting a PhD, getting my, um, I, and I learned how to tell stories. Uh, you know, in, in, in shorthand, you could tell a story very quickly in two acts, you know, 23, 24 minutes. And you learned what audiences laughed at and what they appreciated because we did in front of a live audience every week. And so I, I learned all that. Those were my two big learning experiences for how to do it. There's nothing better. I mean, I was very fortunate that I was able to have a, a father that said, it, you know, didn't mind that I came down there and, and just hung out. Because a lot of fathers would say, you know, it's annoying to have to deal with your kid. And one time it was a, a bad thing. You know this story? This is a fabulous story. I mean, Mary Tyler Moore writes about this in her book. You know this story? I know the story. Yeah, but maybe some people don't know it. Mary Tyler Moore, who played Dick Van Dyke's wife, and at that time she was uh, 24 years old. I was t uh, 14 at the time. And she was gorgeous. I mean, she wore these capri pants, these very tight-fitting pants, and my hormones were going crazy. <laughs> and at one point, I just went up and grabbed her ass. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't stop myself. I just grabbed her ass. You know, it was like, I couldn't believe it. So now, later in the day, my father calls me in the office and he says, let me ask you something. I said, what? He said, did you grab Mary Tyler Moore by the end? Because she went and told on me. She said, you gotta tell, you know. And, and, and I said, yeah, yeah. He says, you know, 
with a big smile on his face, never do that again. <laughs> you know, he figured well, he would like to have done it, but he was living up <laughs> vicariously through me. Okay, so now, yeah, you, remember, I, I, you remember what she used to say every time she would, oh, Rob, she used to go like that all the time. Rob, by the way, the character Rob was, was uh, written uh, based on my, you know, on me, was named after me. So, years later, they're now doing a, uh, a reunion show of All in the Family. And now I've you already been on all, I've been on, I mean, excuse me, you were in the show of Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke reunion show. I've already done all the family, I've already done a lot of films. And they're doing a scene, Dick and Mary are doing a scene where they're in, a, he's in a tuxedo, she's in an evening gown, and they're about to start shooting. And I come down to visit, and I tell the guy, roll the camera, roll the camera. So I walk out onto the set, and I said, you know, Mary, I said, I just want to apologize to you. It's been all these years. I've never really said anything. I felt so bad about what I did when I was 14 years old, but I couldn't help myself. And you were so beautiful. And I just, I was, my hormones. And I said, not that you're not beautiful now, because you're still really beautiful. I said, as a matter of fact, if, you know, I would do it. If you, she bends over like this, and she get, puts that tush out, and I grab her ass like this. And as I grab her ass, she goes, oh, rah. <laughs> so that was the payoff. I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't know if I should ask you. Yeah, no. Listen, it's okay. She wrote about it in a book. She told the story on, on the Letterman show, so I don't feel I'm not telling anything out of school. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question to ask you. Um, what was her ass like? No. <laughs> uh, for, for, for the filmmakers here, because. Um, what happens on the set? You come from television, now you're making a movie, now you have a scene in Stand By Me where they have to, you know, uh, light up or, or dress the whole set for a wide shot for being cast. And there are things that probably you don't know. Yes, there's plenty of things I don't know. And do you ask? Are you afraid to ask? You no, pretend I'm, not, that I'm never afraid to ask if I don't know something, but I'm also not afraid to say what I want if I think that they, they're doing something that's not right. They'll give you an example. Uh, and Tom Del Ruth, who was a great d DP who shot that, he shot all of the West Wing and he shot Br uh, Breakfast Club and he also shot Flipped, he's a great DP. There's a scene in uh, Stand By Me where they're under the porch and the little Vern is digging to try to find his pennies. And he's got, there's a, like a whole bunch, he can't remember where he put the pennies. And there, there's like a lot of holes. And so we're looking under the porch and I see the way Tom is lit. It's very dark in there. You know, it's because it's, under, it's underneath the house, you know, it's underneath the house. And I said, well, Tom, you got to see the, the, all of the, like, gopher holes. Like, there's a hundred gopher holes where he's been trying to find his pennies. I said, if you don't have some light down there, you won't see it. it would, the joke won't read. He says, yeah, but Rob, it's underneath the house. There's no light. There's no light. I mean, we give you a little light. I said, Tom, trust me, you got to light this up because I, this is a gag. This is a big joke that's going to get a huge laugh. And he got mad at me. He got really mad at me. And, and I, this was only my, uh, actually only my second film, because the, the stand, I mean, Spinal Tap was like totally improvised, and I was flying by the seat of my pants. It was only my second traditional film. And so you could get bullied, you know, if you don't know, and especially a guy's got a lot of experience. And I said, no, no, I want it. I want to see the lights. I need to see those, all of those hundred holes that are done. And he says, okay, I'll do whatever you want. I'll light it up like Lucy's living room. I don't give a shit. <laughs> he got really mad at me for doing that. And I had learned a lesson. I had learned a lesson from The Sure Thing, which was I did before. There's a scene in The Sure Thing where um, there's a banner in the back and it says, happy birthday, Co Coach Opawall. And I said, I don't want that banner. I just want it because it's too distracting. It's too distracting. It's, you know, not good. And they said, you have to have it. You can't have a blank wall like that. And I, and I made him, I, I said, no, I, I don't like it. And, and they, they, I shot it and I looked at it and I didn't like it. And then, but I got a great performance out of John Cusack. Then I went back and shot it again and it wasn't as good. And so, had I done the right thing on the day, it would have been okay, so I learned. And there was another scene where, where he goes outside and he's on a little porch and there's a cafe curtains and he's looking through the cafe curtains and he goes like that. And she says, no, you can't have cafe curtains like that. 
half the curtains are meant to be closed. I said, but you can't see his face. <laughs> I was a little, a little cute moment where he goes like that. She said, no, no, and I finally learned it's about serving the master. There's a master, and that's the film. You serve the master, who is telling the story. If you spend too much time in one area, whether it's with the production designer, the DP, the whatever it is, it can throw the thing out of whack. So you, as the director, you, you know, uh, Herb Gardner, uh, the guy who did the uh, uh, Thousand Clowns, told me this once when he directed a film. He says, beware the silent schmuck. Everybody will say it, because the DP knows how to light better than you, the production designer knows better. They'll think you're a schmuck. It's, and everybody will think you're a schmuck at some point, and it's a very lonely job. You're going to be not part of the cast, not part of the crew. And it's like, so where do you want the camera? Schmuck, you know, under their voice. They're saying that. But the truth is, and they all think you're an idiot at some point. But if you know what you want, and you know the story you're telling, they don't know it. <laughs> they only know their area. So they're going to do what they do, and they're going to try to make it perfect. And what I try to do is make them strive for perfection and feel comfortable not getting perfection. Because if you're getting perfection in one area, you're cocking something up in another area. <laughs> you know? So you got to balance all that stuff. So I learn, and I'm not afraid anymore, you know? Uh, I'll listen to everybody, and I listen to everybody, and sometimes they, you know, they're right, and what they say and what they want does dovetail with what the scene needs and it's perfect but sometimes it isn't and you better know what you what story you're telling because otherwise you can be jerked from one place to the next on the set if you don't know what you're doing up there and the other thing i say is if you don't have an idea of what you want to do with the camera put something up there put it up there and then you look and say, oh, th and that at least will get you to thinking, oh, no, it shouldn't be there, it should be here. You know, many, most of the time you'll know what you want, but sometimes you don't. But if you don't, don't look indecisive. Just say, let's put it right there. And they'll go, blah, 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 and then you go, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. And then you can readjust, you know. But if you look indecisive at the moment, they'll, t they'll take advantage of you, particularly your actors. <laughs> actors, if they f sense any kind of insecurity on your part, they get frightened because they're like children. <laughs> and they all of a sudden, no, it is, it's true. You want them to be like children. They're play acting. They need to be vulnerable, just like children. But if they see mommy or daddy is insecure, they're going to start freaking out and acting out, and not acting out in a good way. So you got to be, you know, in control. Yeah. It's a tough job because you really make sure you have a good producer or a good. Um, uh, uh, sounding board, somebody you can that you can talk to and say the honest to God truth to, because you actors, you're not part of the cast and you're not part of the crew. You're somewhere circling above all that. So have somebody you can talk to, a friend, a producer, a cohort, whatever, because you, you're going to need it. It gets it's very lonely. It's a very lonely job. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, last question. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Reiner. My name is Christine. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say I think your films are absolutely incredible, oh, thank and um, I want to thank you so much for being such a such so gracious in answering all of our questions. It's clear that you really have a love for for filmmaking. I obviously. do, I do. I love it. I love the process, and like I say, as you get older, you'll enjoy it even more. You will enjoy it, and just just enjoy the process of it, because that's all it is, you know. Okay, good. Um, my question for you is, as someone who's, um, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I'm not exactly in the film industry, but I want to make a film that I believe would be as inspiring as, as I flatter myself to say, as the ones that you've made. What do you think are the top two things that, as a filmmaker, I would need to keep in mind when making a, a film that would inspire uh, teens? Well, I think you want to do something, first of all, that inspires you. Something that comes from something that you feel, ooh, this really resonates with me. I feel very connected to this. I know these people. I know these characters. I know who they are. That's the number one, number two, and number three. If you can get that, then that will inspire other people. I don't think you have to look inside first before you go outside. Don't look from the outside in. I don't think. I don't think. Thank you very much. You. Did you wait for uh, to ask a question? Yeah? Yes. You. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can't see. Okay, so are you waiting for a question? Sure, if there's time. Yeah. Please, that would be the last one. Because you had waited in the corner, I just saw you. Well, I was waiting for a bit. That's good. Uh, 
My name's Ed. Do you feel pressure? <laughs> <laughs> because it's the last question, it better be good. No, it doesn't have to be about films. It could be sex, religion, politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm also a huge fan of your films. Uh, just the overall themes of a lot of them, I can really relate to. Just the relation to characters and people and dealing with time and your relationships with people wisely. Uh, the Princess Bride, for me, is one of my favorite films of all time. My, my book, my parents love it and showed it to me at a very young age. See that? I love that. See? And it's kind of one of those films for me that I can like just sit, sit on the sofa and just like eat cheese grits and like chill out to. <laughs> I really enjoy it. But for, for, for me to you, I'm curious for you as uh, either in your childhood or as of now, any films that you, you kind of have those go-to films that kind of just resonate with you on all, all aspects of things. Because well, like I say, It's a Wonderful Life is one of those films that I can watch over and over again. Uh, Citizen Kane is on everybody's list. I can watch that over and over again. I always see something else in that. Uh, recent, you know, it's not recent at all, but more recent for me is The Godfather 1 and 2. I pretend The Godfather 3 never happened. <laughs> <laughs> the only Godfather 1 and 2 happened as far as I'm concerned. But those do, and uh, I like a lot of the Woody Allen films that I can watch over and over. And uh, I loved, uh, I'll tell you what I do like is the Ely Kazan films. On the waterfront, and uh, you know, uh, facing the crowd. He was a part of those early those films. I like to watch, and I love Truffaut. I love to watch any Truffaut films. Love those. Uh, I, you know, yeah, there's a lot of films. Lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> what do you think is the trait that contributed the most to your success? The trait? Oh, I I don't know. I you know I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think curiosity, you know, and just wanting to know stuff. And, and you know, I, I wish I had taken, you know, I was in the theater arts department at UCLA. I wish I had taken something else because everything you learn, it comes into play at some point as a director. The more stuff you know, it all comes into play. So, you know, even if you're taking a college, you know, uh, major that has nothing to do with filmmaking, which I would suggest, you know, the humanities or, you know, English or something else, I mean, it, it, it all comes into play. So, I don't know what trait. <laughs> Being a nice guy. I don't know about that. You have to ask the people around me. <laughs> I'm a nice guy. You are a nice guy. You are a nice guy, and of course, um, it uh, manifests itself by you coming here and showing us the movie before it's even out. So it's an incredible treat, and uh, really answering all the questions. And I can see that you want the student to learn from you and from your experience. This and is, it's this a given thing. This is nothing like what I expected it to be. But I'm, I'm so glad to see so many young faces and people, you know, eager to learn and stuff. I mean, it's great. I mean, you know, there's a lot of great film schools around the country, and um, you know, a lot of times when I go to, you know, I've talked at some of them, like SC and different ones. They'll always ask me about, you know, <coughs> how do you get an agent? How do you get in the business? And to me, it's like those things come. But to me, it's about the process of making the films. I mean, that's what you should be focused on. All that other stuff will. You know, if you've got the ability and the talent, all that other stuff will take care of itself. Well, I'm glad that you really like uh, the people here. They're great. <laughs>